John Dower, good morning. And good morning to you, sir. Thank you so much for taking the call. Director of Sophie, A Murder in West Cork, which airs on uh, Netflix, I believe, the back end of June, June 30th. Isn't that right? Indeed, indeed, June 30th. And it being Netflix, the platform Netflix, I'm sure you're going to be expecting huge numbers of people around the world watching it. And, of course, an awful lot of people here in Cork, down in the, down in the south of the country. Can I ask you, because, I mean, it's a, it's a story that has been going on for so many different years, so many different strands, 25 years now. And having watched it, I got the impression that you're the first person to actually bring the story, bring the narrative back to Sophie Toscan de Plantier herself. Was was that your intention? Yes, it was very much our intention. And that, that was our ambition um, uh, from when we first set out trying to make it. And, and, and I know the story for, for people in Ireland is obviously incredibly well known. But I mean, I, I'm from London um, via Scotland. And I didn't, I, I wasn't aware of the story until obviously the podcast. Um, and I thought the podcast was exceptional, but yeah. I, I was struck by listening to the podcast that, that that it felt like they'd almost been seduced by this, this main suspect. And I wanted to know more about um, mm. the victim and the family because it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's sadly a bit of a trend in in a lot of true crime um, series that the victim usually you don't get to know too much about, and mm. I think what marks this case out as well is that the family they've been very active in in this story, mm. you know, to the extent of setting up an association and, and setting off their own legal process in France. Mm. So we were very keen to tell it from that perspective. You, you also got a tremendous amount of access from the family. Obviously, um, Sophie's parents, George and Marguerite, her brother Bertrand, her son Pierre-Louis. But incredible amounts of old video footage of her with her son. Video footage that I had never seen of her in her West Cork home. I saw all of that for well, the first time and it, it really brought her as a person home to me, you know. It, 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 yes, and, and interestingly, that that particularly that footage of Sophie in, in her cottage in Tormor in Cork that we only got that at the eleventh hour. I mean, I should stress we made this film with the family. We didn't make it for the family. We had their blessing. They had no editorial control over over what we did. They obviously trusted us um, to tell the story in a sort of a, a sensitive and a, a nuanced way. Mm. But that that footage of of Sophie in the cottage didn't didn't come in until li- literally the last couple of weeks of our editing, and we've been editing for a good a good few months. Yeah. And 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 Sophie's son Pierre Louis, he hadn't even seen that footage, and it, 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 he found it very difficult watching it. You know, because it's he still has the cottage. That's a place he very much associates with Sophie. So then to see footage of her in it was I think it was it was quite tough for him did you did you go into it and those of you that made it did you go into it with an open mind I I got the impression that you did not how would you respond to that uh, I I said well I changed my mind <laughs> I mean I I went into it with a a very open mind particularly not knowing the story as as well as someone who's who would have grown up with it in Ireland my producer um Sarah Lambert. She's originally from Cork. She obviously knew it very, very well. But I, I didn't, and I, I did approach it with an open mind. I changed my mind about what I believe happened. But, you know, at the end of the day, what I believe I don't think is important. Um, we, we clearly take a point of view in the series. Mm. And, and I think, you know, you can't... You, there's this whole idea that documentaries are somehow objective and we'll, we'll find and tell the truth. It's nonsense. You know, every story, you know, if you sit with somebody in the pub and, and, and tell them a story, you, you, you will give that story a point of view. And yes, our story has a point of view. And I, I, I kind of think that's valid, but I didn't, I didn't come in expecting to tell the story as it, as it, as it unfolds in the three parts. Yes. You know, you talk of three sections to it. I got the impression that there were Three major players involved in this. One of those three obviously lost her life. It struck me watching the documentary that we were looking at a triangle. And the triangle was Sophie, Ian Bailey 
and Marie Farrell. They are the three major <laughs> players yeah. for 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, obviously your listeners and you will be very aware that there's that there happens to be another series having made in this story which which started going out last week and i think you know they take a different point of view and um they do i mean they it, have access. It, it it overlaps in different areas i mean jim sheridan has access and lots of video footage of ian bailey we see him in in different moods, actually, to be quite honest. And many people are worried about his, his consumption of alcohol throughout it. Um, you, you, also, there were issues with Sheridan with regards to the family who withdrew their footage because he takes a particular narrative. That's very sympathetic, I think. What's well, quite sympathetic to Bailey. You're not, actually. Yeah. You hammer away at the issues like the, his, his alibi. You hammer away at the scratches. You hammer away at the confessions. And you introduce a lot of new interesting evidence as regards to whether or not Bailey knew um, Sophie Toscan de Plantier or not. I found that quite interesting, to be honest. Yeah, but I think it's still I think that still stands for the story generally, whether you're talking about Jim Sheridan's series or ours. I mean, I think it's perfectly summarized by um, your your um, your your fine cork reporter, Barry Roach, yeah. um, you know, a great old school journalist and reporter. And, you know, he says, and I, I felt this, he articulates what I felt while making the series, is that Ian Bailey has still not answered several questions and contradictions. He's still not given a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a comprehensive answer to questions about whether he perhaps met Sophie or, or the whole issue of the bonfire for me, which I've, I've never heard Ian talk explicitly about. So I think... There are quite, which is why, unfortunately and sadly, particularly for Sophie's story, that this story, Sophie's family, that this story does continue to rumble on. And and the other character that you point out is, of course, Marie Farrell. I mean, I met Marie several times. Me and my producer, Sarah, we met her several times. She was going to do our film. Then she wasn't going to do our film. She was going to do our film. We were due to sit down with her and, 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 and do some filming, and then she she told us that she, at the last minute, decided to sign an, an exclusive contract with Jim Sheridan. The mm. idea that you'd you'd only talk to one person about this story, I find slightly baffling. Anyway, but then people in people people who followed this story in Ireland will not be, you know, will will not be surprised that Marie Farrell, you know, changes her mind. It, well, in 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 his defence, actually, uh, Ian Bailey did give you off his time um, and sat down with you. He has subsequently come out and said that it's poisonous propaganda and he expects Netflix to burn him on a pyre of lies. I don't know whether you're aware or not, but he's also threatening to sue if he doesn't like what he sees. Yeah, but well, I mean, Ian threatens to sue sort of on a sort of weekly and monthly basis, doesn't he? I mean, I, I, mean, I, I find it. Again, baffling that he's described it as poisonous propaganda when he hasn't even watched it yet. Maybe he should watch it first and then and, and, and then make up his mind. Listen, we did an interview with Ian, um, and then he then decided that he would sign an exclusive contract with Jim Sheridan. Again, I find that a little strange, perhaps even a little unsettling, that a, that a, that a prime suspect who claims he wants to tell everyone his story and get it out there in, in, in mm. the right way signs an exclusive contract. I mean, um, so so when I went back to him with with some of these questions and contradictions that we feel he hasn't really answered, he said, oh, well, I can't talk to you because I have an exclusive contract. So, I mean, mm. he's put himself in a bit of an invidious position, really. He's tied his own hands. You know, it, it's a bit rich to accuse us of propaganda when he then decided to stop talking to us. You can't really have it both ways, even though he likes to generally have it both ways. Um, do, you, do you think that much of that way that he, he lived his life over the past 25 years, because he was a reporter in the offset with regards to the Sophie story, he was covering it um, when he became a, a suspect, a suspect of the Gardaí, uh, he still continued to very much court the media. Do, do you do you think that that's that's part of what's happened to his life? How his life has imploded because he loves the limelight. He loves to be part. Loves to be the centre of attention. Yes, I don't think that's helped him in any way. I mean, the, the, again, 
as I said, I, I there was a I didn't know a great deal about the story when I first came across it, but I was struck by a couple of things. One, which I thought was very unusual for a, for a, 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 a true crime story, if you like, was the, was that the the main suspect, the prime suspect, and you know, Ian has declared himself the prime suspect at times with, you know some sort of strange enjoyment is as if he takes satisfaction from it. But the, the, the prime suspect was a journalist, as you say, reporting on the case who continued to then report on the case when he was a suspect, which feels fairly unique. And every time this story feels like it's, it, it's going away, it's, it's Ian who generally resurrects it. So, um, I mean, I, I hear, which, you know, having met Ian several times and, and witnessed him try and use a very basic, mobile phone which is fine i now hear he's got himself a twitter account an yeah. instagram yeah. account he's i mean he, you know well, he's, he's, enti- he's, en- again, he's entitled to he's, at the center but he's entitled to all of that we all have twitter accounts we all have instagram accounts i mean did, did, did you look yeah, at the, di- di- you- the difference is he's di- he's set these up again re- around this story it's not like he's got a personal account i mean he each time you know he has this double argument that you know he just wants to be left alone and live his life but he keeps throwing himself back into the story he you know he he wants the attention of it i mean it was also you can't have it both ways it was you also the it, it was also the first time that i saw somebody you know and, and netflix and your series did this to look at ian bailey's life before he came to ireland i mean he seems to have paid an awful lot of high prices for something that he was never found guilty of. I mean, when he was in the UK, he was he was flying as an investigative journalist. He got married, he had a big house. Something went wrong. He ended up penniless. We got it. We got insight into all of that for the first time from from you guys. And and apparently he was damn good at his job as well at the same time, wasn't he? So then he he came here to start a, a new life, wasn't it? To to try again. He wanted to be a a, a poet where. You make out in the in the Netflix show that he's not much of a poet. Well, well I mean, what do you think of his poetry? Not, not, not much. <laughs> but well, there you go. So but, I don't think that's. I don't think you can beat me with that stick. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. We got to see. And we got yeah. to see other as like we saw different aspects of Sophie's life. We saw different aspects of his life as well before Ireland. Um, and and then of course we we watch it all unravel where you question over and over again as to you know. Uh, uh, how how did he know that Sophie hadn't been sexually assaulted? You go into an awful lot of detail about what time he knew about the crime, why he went to the house when nobody knew about it. There's huge time differences there. And of course, yeah. you, you spend an awful lot of time on the confessions, which he claims were um, black humour. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm, yeah, I mean, listen, it, in our series... We don't say Ian Bailey is guilty. He's not been found guilty in an Irish court of law. Mm. But we do, you know, he he has been found guilty in France. Now, whether you accept that or not, he has been found guilty there. And and we present that in the film. So that's, I don't think there's anything controversial about that. And there are voices in our series that also, that do question whether that's right. You know, the validity of that. Um, he, He could quite happily go over there and defend himself but he again says that he won't get a fair trial um you know this yeah. american witness that you found who stayed on the house yes. at th- that i had never heard of that lady before where she said that she saw his big black co- coat soaking in a bucket of water yeah she did she did give a police statement but again listen you know you know as well as i do that the problem with this case is that there were some errors made by the guardie? They just they just were. That's why there there, there remains these 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 grey areas. You know, statements were not taken. You know, off 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 key people. You know, that, that character you mentioned in America, Ariana. You know, she couldn't believe that, given that she was in the house of the the main suspect you know, the, the day, you know, during when this happened, why why did the police only come to her a lot later and take a statement, which is, you know, it, 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 it's, it's sadly the problem with this story is that, you know, it does happen. You know, it, it does happen in some cases where mistakes are made. We're all human. But I think that's another reason why this this story did, continues to play out did, as well as... as 
as well as Ian continuing to put himself at the centre of it. And did you get the impression while you were here that people in Ireland, particularly in West Cork, are very divided on what they believe or whom they believe? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's difficult. I mean, you know, understandably, I think a lot of them are just, oh, we don't we don't want to talk about this anymore. You know, the, you're the... You're, you know, you're the third lot of people to come trundling through our very small and beautiful village of, of, of Skull. But I think, I think when people knew that we were we were attempting to make this very, you know, with Sophie's family, we, we found things a, a lot a lot easier. Um, but I, yeah, people are divided, and I think you show that at the end of at the end of you know. I don't want to give away the end of the you know this. It's not like it was a huge revelation, but there are people that do believe that Ian is innocent, and we 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 give them a voice. But I suppose form. you know he he has to be innocent if he hasn't been found guilty in an Irish court. I mean, wasn't the French trial a bit of a farce, really, considering the evidence that was used of Marie Farrell, which he subsequently recanted and retracted? But yet the French ploughed on with it. You know, there wasn't much more than yeah, that, yeah. so there wasn't. Yeah, but why? Why did Marie Farrell retract that evidence? <laughs> I don't why? Know. <laughs> well, I, yeah, well, I think we try. We, 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 you know, we we do go to some lengths to explain. You know, as as Detective Dwyer says, you know, she kept the same story for all these years, and then suddenly changed her mind. And then when she changed her mind, she she kept getting caught out in you know different versions of the change story which is you know was which seems a little telling in itself but yes again there is you know marie is another reason why this again sadly this story will probably never have a resolution because you can't because she's changed her story now so many times you can't take anything that's right you know it, yeah. it, 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 it is harder to take what she said at face value, but it wasn't the French trial wasn't just based on Marie Farrell's testimony. It was based on the testimony of a lot of other people. But you know, again, you know, Neil. As I said, we're not. You know, we do not. You know, we don't set out to say this is the story of a man who is clearly guilty. That is not our film. Um, and ultimately, a viewer is left to make their mind. Oh, absolutely. Our, you know, and, again. and and I, and I don't want to give too much away in advance. You're absolutely right before people have an opportunity to sit down and watch it. But who who's the audience this time round? Is it because as you say a lot of, no there are a lot of int- new new points brought to the fore, things that I hadn't known, things that I'd forgotten. Um a lot of what we knew, but is is it a world audience that you're pitching to? Will this air all over the planet on Netflix? Yeah, yeah. Netflix have a have a have a have a global reach. I think it's something like 190 countries. So yeah, I mean, if people decide, you know, Netflix is is a different sort of broadcaster. They're a you know a streaming platform. They they work you know on the old algorithms. And if people decide that that they start to find this interesting, it'll it'll spend more and more time on their front page, and more and more people will see it. And I I, I do think a lot of people. I know your audience will find this slightly incredulous, incredulous, but I think a lot of people do not know this story, and it is, you know, that's always the, it's always a bit of a dilemma with a sort of true crime documentary because you know if you start talking about how great the story is, it, it starts to feel a little bit distasteful, but it is still, it's still a fairly extraordinary story. It, you are very right it. there because I've been following and covering this story for 25 years and even in the last two weeks I've been talking with people on the air of a different generation to me who knew nothing about it and are only learning about it now. It's like buses. For 20 years nothing was happening and then a podcast comes along and two documentaries. <laughs> you know? I know, but that, that, that often happens and I think that's one of the, I think that's one of the, um, you know, the byproduct of this so-called gold rush of documentaries, which is great, you know, people like Netflix and Amazon and Apple and all these, you know, you know, want documentaries. But what happens more and more is that you find that there are, you know, a couple of people making the same story. I mean, I had it myself on, you know, I made a, I made a film with the, um, some of your listeners might be familiar with, with the British um, journalist Louis Theroux. We yeah. made a film about. Um, yeah. Uh, the Church of Scientology, and at the same time, um, a film was being made by the 
the, the great American documentary director Alex Gibney. But you know that's fine. They, you know, I think I think there's room uh, if it's a good story, it's a strong story. There's there's room for different versions. And do you believe that? Telling. Do you believe that the French side of this, which would be Pierre Louis, uh, Bertrand, and and Sophie's very aged parents, do you think that they won't rest until they believe Bailey should be in a French jail? Well, I don't, you know, Pierre Louis certainly won't. I mean, he, you know, he says as much in the film. They, they, yes, they, they, I mean, I think they want to bring Ian Bailey to France for a proper trial. I mean, it's, you know, Ian, uh, Ian Bailey has been found guilty in his absence in, in France. That doesn't just mean that if, if they take him to France, he gets put straight into prison. He then has a, a proper trial in France that's what would happen but sure you can't um, bring somebody to another country to, to answer for a crime that wasn't committed in that country it's bizarre yes I agree with you it is bizarre but that is French law and they have done that so um, <laughs> um, yeah I mean again it's another one of the peculiarities of this story but that that is something that you can do in, in French law so uh, um, you, you know again we, we, we do question whether that should happen what, what, in, in the film. One, one point, and, and I won't keep you much longer, it's just a fascinating That's topic right. of conversation, um, because there, of course, is another woman in this story, and that's Jules Thomas, and you detail his um, his assaults upon her, and we see the injuries, uh, and there were there were numerous assaults, as, as we know, and you document. Um, she didn't feature in your, in your documentary, or did I miss, did I miss it? No, 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 she didn't. She wouldn't speak to us. Okay. And, you know, ultimately we respected that. I mean, we, I think we made one approach to her and then Ian said to me, look, she's, she's, she won't talk to you guys. And I respect that. She doesn't, I mean, I'm not going to put someone in front of camera if they, if they, if they're conflicted about going in front of camera with us. That's, um, she just didn't want to. Gotcha. So yeah, that's yeah. fine. But yes, yeah, I'd, I'd have loved to have spoken to her about it but you know and that relationship has come to an end uh you're clearly aware of that and in conversation last week she said that um he's looking for a house if he can't find somewhere to live he's going to live in a in a caravan huge price to be paid for a man found guilty of no crime well well i think you're i think you're being a bit disingenuous there because i think his his reasons for not living with Jules don't come down to him not being found guilty of this crime. It's been True. it's been well established that he beat her several times, and I've seen the photographs, which we decided not to put in our film, and they are they're horrific. So Ian, if anything, yeah, as you say, he could very well be innocent of. Um, um, I'm not talking about legally, but he did not that he didn't kill Sophie, but he certainly he certainly beat Jules black and blue several mm. times mm. you know that's <laughs> that might be a reason he he'll find himself living in a caravan pretty soon mm. you know not mm. not not the fact that he's listen again we stress at the end of our film that Ian Bailey has not been found guilty in a British or Irish court of law and we have certain people saying you know one character says I think he's been found guilty of his personality it may be as simple as that but again, our series does present a view that there are still things that he hasn't possibly answered satisfactorily. Unanswered satisfactorily. questions. I get you. I Indeed. get you. Okay. Indeed. John, Indeed. thank you so much for taking the time out today. I appreciate you taking the call. Congratulations on the documentary. Sure. It airs on June 30th on Netflix. Have a good day. And you. Thank you, sir. Neil Prendeville, the voice of Cork. Weekdays 9 to 12. Cork's Red FM. Red FM. Red FM.